nor drink. It was in Alaska, way out in the Aleutian Islands. And we finished up a case, and there was a preacher there that was following that case. And that night I was to catch an airline and go back to Anchorage and go home. And he was there and he said, listen, David, I've got a small airplane. And I'm down here and I have my plane and I can save you that ticket to Anchorage. You guys just get in the airplane and fly with me. And I said, I really appreciate that. But I said, I'm not big on small planes, especially in Alaska. I said, you got mountains all over this place. I said, I really appreciate it, but no thanks. Well, then in front of everybody, he did something. He said, well, if God's money don't matter, go ahead, spend it. And I'm like, you rascal. That's not fair. I said, listen, I, we try to pinch the hide off of every nickel. He said, come on. Well, then... A lawyer I was traveling with, he said, well, it would save quite a bit of money. I said, will you shut up? <laughs> you got to help me here. Well, this guy just pressed and pressed. And at that point, I knew very little about traveling in small planes. But I just didn't like the sound of it. And, and I said, well, how many years have you been flying? Oh, he said, not too many, but I'm very good at it. I said, well, what does not too many mean? He said, well, just not too many. I made the mistake of a lifetime. I said, okay, I'll go with you. We went out to the airport, saw his airplane. I thought, this isn't too bad. It's a nice looking airplane. At least it was shiny. <laughs> Let me help you something. How shiny the plane is means nothing. <laughs> nothing. We got in the airplane, it was dusk, it was just starting to get dark, and boy, he started it up, and boy, I thought, this kind of neat. Man, he knew just what he was doing, and we taxied out, he did it beautifully. And we lined all up, and he said, okay, let's pray, and I said, yeah, I'll be praying, and I'll pray the whole time, too. <laughs> so I'm saying, God, get me safe to this Anchorage airport. Well, we start down the runway, and it's beautiful. Just lifts right off, and we're gaining altitude. And the lawyer in the back seat, I was sitting up front next to the pilot. He hit me on the back. He said, see, you were worried about nothing. I thought, we're not there yet. <laughs> we took off, and we're climbing for about 60 seconds, maybe a little more, and we went into the clouds. And the pilot turns to me and he says, I can't fly in the clouds, I don't know how. <laughs> I said, you what? And he looked at me, and he said, I'm feeling sick. <laughs> and he put his head back and rolled his eyes. He said, you'll have to take over. <laughs> this is what I said. I said, you wake up. You're going to fly this plane, and when you're done, I'm going to kill you. Then you're going to put your eyes back. How did I ever, ever, ever get talked into this? <laughs> he went apoplectic on us. He just mumbled. He's like having a trance. The plane is just... <laughs> now, I'm shaking so bad, my voice is having trouble getting under control. And someone says, you prayed, right? I was too scared to pray right then. I just kept hitting him. I'm saying, come on, come on, fly this thing, fly it. Finally, it dawned on me, he's a goner. 
He's <laughs> now there's one thing in the radio stack that's lit. And the fellow in the back seat said, let's call on the radio. I said, okay. And he's got the mic stretched to the back seat. And he's saying, hello, hello, anybody there, hello? And then he'd reach up and flip it one. He'd say, hello, hello, anybody there, hello? And he'd flip it again. Hello, hello. Well, we're doing that for probably 10 minutes. Finally, he flipped and he said, hello, hello, anybody there? And an American Airlines cargo plane flying out of Anchorage to Tokyo said, hello, hello, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Do you not know proper radio etiquette? I said, you tell him we don't know nothing. You tell him. <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing, nothing. We said, listen, we, we, we got a pilot here that's passed out. He's, he's epileptic and we, we do not know what we're doing. Can you help us? And he said, well, I'll stay with you. He said, I'll start staying because I don't want to lose you. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Anchorage and I'm going to get somebody to help you. He said, you guys have to have, and these were his words, you've got to have somebody you can listen to to get you home. Who? Finally, we could, you still there? You still there? That American, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm here, guys, I'm here. He said, I'm flying circles. And he said, you're pretty close to me, and I just want to tell you, you're in a mountain range. <laughs> Finally, this voice came on. And they said, this is Anchorage. And I'm the voice you guys got to listen to. He said, my job is to get you safely home. Now he said, I don't know where you're at. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a turn to your left. And let me see if I can spot you on one of the radar screens with a turn. So we turned it a little bit. And he said, okay, make a turn to the right. We did that. And that went on for about five minutes. And finally he came back and he said, now you hear me. I found you. And you're headed for a mountain. You're about six to seven minutes from crashing. You're going to follow my words. Turn the plane to the right. I said, tell him we are turning. He said, no, you're not. You've got to listen to me. Not what you feel. You've got to listen to me. Turn to the right. Finally, he found us. He said, okay, I've called someone in who's familiar with the type of aircraft you're in. We're going to bring you home. The American Airlines guy said, I'll stay with them. And over the radio, he said, everybody does it for the first time, one time. I said, yeah, but you didn't do it with a cocked out pilot laying just dead. He said, no, I understand. He flew us back to Anchorage. Now we got to Anchorage and he said, there's some weather. And I got to take you through some storm. And it's going to scare you. But I'm with you. You keep listening to my voice. He said, I'm going to line you up and start you down. And he said, a wonderful thing's going to happen. 
He said, just before you're at the runway, you're going to see a cross. And he said, when you see those lights, you're home. I had no idea that was there. We started down, and boy, the plane was just getting beat to death. And he said, I'm with you now. You got to do just what I say. Go a little left. You're descending too fast. Pull back. You guys, I'm going to bring you home, but you got to listen. And then, boom, there was the lacrosse lights. We landed. Not very well. Uh, best I could count, I landed four times. <laughs> the runway lights I tore up, they said more. We no sooner landed, and the pilot woke up. He said, I'll take over now. I said, don't you touch nothing. I was so shook, I couldn't walk. Somebody came up to me and he said, are you David? I said, you're the voice. He said, yeah, I am. He said, thanks for letting me get you home. There's a voice that wants to get you home. but you got to be willing to hear. you got to say, speak. Thy servant listens. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Too many times, I just off doing it on my own. Where's the voice? No, I made a terrible mistake. I decided not to concern my wife with what happened because I didn't want her to worry. And a week later, the FAA called my home. And they said, Is you're the husband that almost crashed into a mountain and <laughs> landed with an uncut. And she said, No, 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 no not him was his name and he gave my name and address and cell phone number she said yeah that's all correct but he'd have told me <laughs> when I called home that night my wife said anything unusual happen in Alaska <laughs> I thought sweet Alabama I'm sunk <laughs> I said, honey, God gave a voice. And I'm standing here now because that voice took us home. God's got a voice that wants to get you home. It's his voice.